Well, then I, I appreciate the questions. I always enjoy, um, you know, that's where the Lord put my heart. And that's what um, I like talking about my, I call it home now. That's our home. I'm away from home. You know, everybody says, you know, welcome home. It's like, I left home, man. My heart's there. I want to be there. I'm here because of necessity. You know, Paul talked of, uh, and obviously to be, if I were really spiritual, I would say my home is in heaven, which we know that we are seated in heavenly places and Christ is our life and all that. Humanly speaking, um, my, you know, Paul spoke of will, wishing to be, to be absent from the body, which would be far greater, but for you it is needful that I be here. So fiscally speaking, it's needful that I'm here, but my heart is almost 5,000 miles away. So um, if you under, if, I hope you understand. Uh, the missionaries in here, I'm sure, know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, it's good to be here. Uh, if you would turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. The Lord's given me a kind of a theme, kind of a heart. Um, missionary supposed to preach on missions. I didn't do that a lot on deputation, and maybe I don't know how, how that all worked out. But the Lord has, in the time since then, given me a, a, a vision or an idea of what to preach or how to, how to convey my heart for the work that the Lord has for us. Not me, not you, not you, us. The Bible speaks almost exclusively, especially to the New Testament church in collective terms. God did not call individuals to do individual tasks. He called a body. That's why the almost all of Paul's epistles are written to churches, local churches. And each, that's why he said, be of one mind, always thinking the same thing, being, of, being in one accord. Why? Because if you're out of chord, if, if you know anything about music, a chord that is not played correctly, it's, it's, there's a dissonance. It doesn't sound correctly. It doesn't sound right. There's something off about it, and it doesn't convey the, the message that it's supposed to. A, a piano that's out of tune, or a, a note that's hit just, just not, quite so, not, not quite right, it's, it's, there's something off about it. And God wants His church to be in one accord, of one mind. For the purpose that he has set for the body. And I believe that that purpose is, and I believe the Bible is very clear, that purpose is to glorify God, edify the body of Christ, and preach the gospel to the lost and dying world around us. So we're going to see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't know, is it your, is it your custom to stand for the reading? If you would stand with me then. We're going to read here, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. The Bible says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. This evening I want to try to encourage you a little bit tonight. Missions minded, okay, that's, that's, that's where we're going, that's the, the end goal here. But the trajectory is a little bit different. I want to encourage you tonight to realize that the work that we are in, it's not our work. It has never been our work. It's His work. And we are workers together with Him. 
The other verse, it was actually on the, on the video, I preached from this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Amen. And the modern versions mess that all up. They say we're workers together of Him. Come on, man, where to God? Is He sitting in the house drinking tea while we're out here doing the whole thing? I don't think so. He is right here with us, or in fact, we are right here with Him. And it's His work that will survive the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. And so what we're, we're going to talk about tonight for just a few minutes is workers together with Him. Our job as co-laborers with God and the blessing that it is to be able to just work alongside our Savior. Father, we love You. I thank You for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that He made Himself of no reputation took upon Himself the form of a servant. And Lord, he, he did all that because He loved You. And that now the love of Christ constrains us, that we do the same, that we humble ourselves, that we become servants, that we serve others. And uh, in this context, that we preach the gospel message. As Paul said, I'm debtor unto all men. Lord, we are debtors. We have, a, we have a message and something that the world needs. But Lord, help us to remember that it's you. It's you that does this. And we just simply get to be along for the ride. That it's your, your work. It's your power. It's your ministry. And that we just simply get to be the... We, we get the blessing of being a part of it. We ask, Lord, that you would speak through me. Speak through your word. That it would be the word of God that worketh effectually in them that uh, believe. It wouldn't be my words, but it would be you. And that uh, at the end of the day, Father, we'll give you all the glory, all the praise, all the recognition, because it's not of us. It is only of you. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you very much. We often operate as though... God needs us to do something for God. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a missionary. That's the term we have for missionary. It's not in the Bible, but hey, there you go. I've got, got to get something. I'm a missionary, so I'm doing something. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being involved in every possible facet of the ministry of your local church. I absolutely believe in that. I believe that when the doors are open, you should be there. I believe that when there's an activity, you should participate. I believe that when there's a need, you should be willing to give. I absolutely believe that. However, that mindset, if it's not, if it doesn't start from the right position, everything gets out of whack. If you understand what I'm saying. It's not that, oh, I need to do something. It's that I get to serve God in doing this. Often our tendency is to think that if I'm doing all these things, that I'm serving God. When the service to God starts here, in the Old Testament, and we don't have time to run all of the, all of the uh, passages, but in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, God gets completely fed up with Israel serving Him. And they were doing everything by the letter. By the book, to the letter, everything was being done perfectly on schedule every day. Everybody had the right clothes, everybody showed up at the right time, and they were just, everything was perfect. And God said, you know what, I'm sick of it. Why? He said, because this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I'm afraid that a lot of times we get into a rut of doing something because it's what we do and not because we love God. And when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, if that stuff even shows up, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble, and it's just going to feed the bonfire. Because it wasn't for the right reason. And so we do something for God, and then God's like, oh, well, good luck, pal. Have at it. Because he's not involved because we started with the wrong attitude. That we have to do something to please God instead of walking in the Spirit and seeking God's direction 
so that we can be workers with him, so that we can work in his labor. Sometimes we think, or the, the tendency is to, I, this idea that God is desperately looking for somebody. And now, don't get me wrong, the Bible says that, that God called for a man. Jeremiah chapter 5 starts off, See if there be any in the city that, that, that crieth after judgment and that sigheth for, for righteousness, and I will pardon the city. I get it, that God's sometimes looking for an individual. That God calls men to do certain things and, and other things, but it's not that God needs that individual. God's looking for somebody that, want, that has the same heart that God has. That's why David, even though every time David is mentioned almost in the New Testament, it taught, well, not every time, but uh, for, for instance, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ there in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, it talks about, it just pops out and mentions Bathsheba. Man, that's not cool. Here's David and talking about the wondrous things that, wondrous thing that he is in Christ's lineage. And it has to mention that whole thing with Uriah the Hittite. Man. But you know what? Despite all that, David had, the, David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. And that's why God dealt with him. That's why he had the sure mercies of David. That's why he had a special blessing that, mo, that nobody else got. Because he wanted God so badly that even when he messed up, God knew that this guy wants what I want. I think I can work with that. God doesn't need any one of us. Not a single one. But he wants to use us if we will allow ourselves to be used by God. So first of all here... In verse 1, as we already read, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. We see that, number one, we are workers together with God. Workers together with God. And there in verse 1, it says, beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now notice that in the Bible, the phrase in vain, especially talking to the church, has nothing to do with losing your salvation, not being saved, or anything like that. It almost always has to do with losing rewards and the judgment seat of Christ. Paul talked to the Thessalonians about making sure he was worried that, that he had run in vain. Why? Because they weren't living, if, if they weren't living and walking correctly. He told them that ye are crowning our, our, our joy, right? He said, for ye are our crown and our joy. I, th I think that's how it goes. I'm thinking in Spanish here. Why? Not because, oh, you got saved. Yay, now I've got a crown. But because you live it. That's what Paul was concerned about. That's what Paul was excited about. Was that there was fruit that remained for his labor. And that's what we see there. The grace of God in the work. That you receive not the grace of God in vain. If we think that we're doing this work of our own, or if we wind up doing it of our own volition, of our own power, the grace of God is sitting there on the shelf, completely unutilized, and what we're doing is completely in vain. It is the grace of God that allows us to do anything of lasting effort, of lasting value. Because in this world, in this life, you can do all sorts of churchy things. I'm telling you, you can do every churchy thing in the book. You can be in all the ministries, and if it's not by the grace of God, it's all a waste of time. God wants us to do His work His way. We'll talk about J. Hudson Taylor later, maybe. But look at verse 3. I don't want to skip verse 2, but it's a quote of Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. It's just a reference to the Old Testament. If you like, I like, I like noting, uh, writing that down. I went through and found all the Old Testament references in these passages a uh, long time ago. But verse 3 says, Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Not only is there the grace of God in the work, but there's also an offense of the gospel in the work. Now, the minister has no place to give offense in the work. That's why I tell people, if you're going to go door to door, pop a Tic Tac. You don't need to be offensive. You don't need to have offensive breath in the work. That's not what it's talking about, but you know, I like the illustration. There is no room for us to be offensive personality-wise. 
opinionated. There is no stinking reason to discuss politics at the door with the person. I mean, come on. We're there about the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to drag Donald Trump into it? Lord have mercy. Let's, let's keep on, on track here, folks. Let's talk about what matters. It's a lost soul there that's going to hell. It has no matter. It, it, it means nothing what he voted last election. I mean, come on. There's no reason to be an offense in the, the work. But there is an offense in the gospel. If you'll notice all through the Bible, whether it was Jesus Christ himself, whether it was the apostles, or the apostle Paul, every time they spoke out the gospel, guess what? They tried to kill him. Well, you know, aren't you supposed to be love and lovey and happy and have everybody come and be seeker, seeker sensitive and all that? No. Because if you speak the truth, it will naturally, automatically, all you have to do is stand up and quote a scripture verse. And people get angry. The gospel does its own offending, okay? And now, if you, if you want to look at it, we're not going to go all there, but in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, the Jews, by the way, on a Jewish holiday, he gives the whole story of the crucifixion of Jesus, and says, you have crucified your Messiah. And the Bible says that when they heard this, they were pricked at, in their heart and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, go over to chapter 7, and the exact same message, almost verbatim, is preached. This time to the religious crowd. And Stephen gets down there and says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart, ye crucified the Messiah. How long will ye resist the Holy Ghost? And the Bible says when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. You see the difference there? It was the same exact message delivered by a man full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. But in Acts chapter 2, it was people that were willing to receive the truth. They wanted the truth no matter how bad it hurt. You see that? There was an offense, but they were willing to receive it anyway. In Acts chapter 7, you have some hard-hearted religious folks, and they weren't going to take it regardless of how it was delivered. And they killed the messenger. So those are the effects of the word the, the pricked at their heart and, re and received it, or they were cut to the heart because why? They have a hard heart that resisted, and instead of just being able to be pricked, the thing cut them. Because the word of God is, a, is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints of marrow, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So there is an offense of the gospel in the work, but it's not ours to give. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, he said. Why? Because if you tell the truth, they can't blame the ministry. All they can do is get mad at what God said. Thus saith the Lord is our message. That's our ministry. And if there's all sorts of ways that we can give blame to the ministry. There's all sorts of people that have blown out, blown up, done something crazy, and brought offense to the ministry. That's not what we're supposed to do. This here, we're talking about the offense of the gospel in the work that's naturally there. Look at verse 4. It says, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, so not only are we workers together with God in verse 1, but now in verse 4, we are ministers together of God. The ministry, if you remember Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that he gave these gifts, which are some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry. What is the ministry? It's right here. Ministering one to another. So we are ministers together of God. That means that we have now all, every single one of us, been given a gift. And we're not talking about uh, blabbing or, or flopping around on the floor like a dog. That has nothing to do with the Bible. Charismatic nonsense. So every one of us has been given a gift, a measure of grace or a, or a different grace. And those are all for ministering one to another. Look. Your preacher works hard, I'm sure. 
preparing sermons, preparing lessons. Going, I, I imagine he does series of different things and studies on this, that, and the other thing. But you know what? You need sustenance every day. Three times, three, four times a week just ain't going to do the trick. Now, I don't know if, you've, if anybody's into dietary stuff and working out, but intermittent fasting is kind of all the rage these days. You have an eight-hour window of, of eating, or six, eight-hour window of eating, and then 16 hours where you don't eat. So you can eat a large variety of stuff in that eight hours, but then for 16 hours, you've got to cut it off. So that, that's, that's okay. It works, and it, it helps get the metabolism back online and everything. That's great. But there is no diet, no intermittent, fa no intermittent fasting schematic in which you don't eat for four days. That's not a diet. That's starvation. Especially when we're talking about the Word of God. We need to be in that thing every day. We need to be receiving from that and ministering one to another every day. And that's not just the preacher. Every one of us we, have all, we all have the same Holy Spirit. Is that, not, is that not the case? If you're saved, you have the same Holy Spirit the preacher does. You have the same book the preacher does, don't you? Well, help the preacher out. Listen for the Holy Spirit, get in that book. And then if somebody has some trouble, instead of saying, oh man, we've got to tell the preacher about that, say, well, you know what the Bible says over here? Now, I'm not saying take the preacher's job. Okay? But I'm telling you, I bet you, if, I bet you he'd be really encouraged to hear that old brother so-and-so you know, encourage the other brother because he took the scripture, he knew what he needed and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and man encouraged him and went down the road and did something for God. With God. Remember? I bet that would be a real encouragement. It would be an encouragement to me to hear that somebody there, down there in a Sorno had gotten in the book and saw something, the Lord revealed something to him and he talked to a friend and was able to minister to him. Because we're ministers together of God. In the body, every member has its function. There is not one part of the body that does all the work while everything else just sits there and listens. Everything has its function. That's why the Bible likens the church to a body. Because every member, every organ has an integral function in the, in the body to make everything work. So we're ministers together of God. Verse 4 and 5 shows... We already read the second half there. Um, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, there's a suffering of the minister. Now, I just, I'll come right out and say, I have experienced little to none of that. But that is the pattern that the Bible gives as a true minister of the gospel. And Paul was able to say, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ. Literally could have taken his tunic or whatever they wore on his upper part, to have taken his shirt off and shown, yeah, this over here, this here, this here, and this thing on my eye, that's from when I was stoned to death in Lystra. And this over here, these lashes right here, well, this, this part and this part up here, the other part was from somewhere else, but this part is when I was when I was whipped in Philippi. And this over here, this limp that I have, is when I broke my leg in that, in that shipwreck. Wow. So, you mean that's a true minister of the God? Well, that's what the Bible says. That's hard sometimes for us to understand. We've got, we got the air conditioning and the nice chairs, and I, I'm, I'm all for it. It's really comfortable. All right? But we have this idea that, that oh, well, this is ministry. Ministry is right there. It's not real pretty. It's the suffering that God calls us to that we, so we can be more like Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say? He said, the foxes, have holes, the, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He didn't even have a pillow to his name. And we, we call ourselves Christians, which supposedly means Christ-like. I don't know how accurate that is. But a minister which isn't just a minister, somebody is the reverend. Who ever started calling preachers reverend? That is a mess. There's one reverend in the Bible, and the Bible says God, reverend is his name. So, no thank you. But ministers is just someone who ministers, someone who serves. That's to be every one of us. Just like Jesus 
girded himself with a towel and got down and washed his own disciples' feet. That's ministering. And he said, if I'm your master can do this, then come on, guys, figure it out. So there's suffering of the minister, but also there in verse 6, it says, By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. We also see the sufficiency of the minister. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but it's of God. And this is always rough here, but you see the very first thing in that list? By pureness. The Bible says that the wisdom in uh, James chapter 2, the wisdom that comes from above is first pure. Hmm. If a man purify himself from these, 2 Timothy chapter 2, hmm, he shall be a vessel for the finer, fit to every good use. Or Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, Holy, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. So it's like holiness, pureness, that's like really big on God's importance list. It's way up there. The sufficiency of the minister is supposed to, and again, I'm not talking about the preacher. I'm talking about those who are ministering every member of the body. It starts with pureness. It starts with presenting your body's living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. By knowledge. This is the knowledge of God. This isn't just something you go to the seminary and get your head pumped full of for, you know, some money every month that you pay the guy. It has nothing to do with that. Now, again, I'm not against it. I, I went through a seminary. I'm going to teach a seminary. Okay. But this knowledge is knowing God. What did Paul say? The man who had wrote in Philippians, he had written most of his 14 books by that point, and he said, that I may know him. Wait, Paul, you are writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he wanted to know him even more. You will never know God enough. But you know what? Your sufficiency, meaning what makes you capable of ministering in the body, is that knowledge of God. Knowing Him. Drawing closer to Him. By long suffering. The ministry is suffering long. People make jokes and stuff about people. You know, the ministry would be great if it weren't for people. Well, come on. Ministry is people. And there's people that just, you know, sometimes they just do stuff and you have to suffer long. Sometimes your friend, sometimes your brother in Christ, they're going to do something and you're just going to have to deal with it. Out of love, was we're getting there, by love unfeigned there at the end. He said, let love be without dissimulation. A true, absolute love, which in 1 Corinthians 13 is charity. Just love in action. The perfection of love. Which is what Jesus Christ said, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another even as I have loved you. Getting ahead of the verse here, it says, by kindness. I have a lot of people that are just not kind. Not necessarily nice. Okay, Nice is our modern way of saying certain things, but kindness. Look what the Bible talks about being kind. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There's that long suffering again. By the Holy Ghost. We saw that in verse 3. I'm sorry, verse 1. Uh, the grace of God. That it is the Holy Ghost and it is His working in us that allows us to do any of these things. Jesus Christ said that I am the true vine and my Father is the husbandman and ye are the branches. If ye abide in me, ye will bear fruit. And he said in the... And Whatever branch that bears fruit, my father, um, I forget the actual word. Somebody help me. I'm going to look it up real quick. Purgeth it. Thank you, brother. Um, it's different in Spanish. That's what I was thinking. Um, my father purgeth it that it might bring forth 
more fruit. Hmm. And he said, and if ye abide in me and I in you, ye shall bring forth much fruit. Those three levels. Fruit is good. Much, or more fruit is better. But much fruit, that's where God wants us to be. It's kind of like over there in Romans 12 too. That ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God has it all laid out for us. But that is the Holy Ghost. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. Singular. The fruit, not fruits. Fruit. There's nine of them, but it's one fruit. That's God's math, which is way harder than my homeschool math. But it's the Holy Spirit bearing that fruit in our lives. It is the demonstration of the Holy Spirit inside of us. In uh, Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 5, when it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, it's preceded by a section that talks about the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And it goes through a whole long list. I think there's 13 there. Just in case you don't believe in, in uh, biblical numerics, have fun with that one. And then there are nine fruit of the Spirit, which nine in the Bible is the number of fruitfulness. Huh. Who would have, would have thought? And so the flesh works. If you're working in the flesh, you're not going to have anything to show for it. But if you are in Christ, if you abide in Him, if your sufficiency comes from the Holy Ghost, you will bear fruit, and that's what God's looking for. So we're workers together with God in verse 1. We're ministers together of God in verse 4. And now in verse 7, it says, By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, we see the word and the power of God, which in the, in the, the end result or the, the final word, when everything's said and done, it's the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God, the power of God, that allows us to do anything. You have to have both, okay? I believe that the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is a present tense verb. I believe that when I am in this, in this book, if the Holy Spirit is not giving witness to it, look, a lost person can read the same exact words that I am. Do you, you agree? There's lost people who do it all the time scholars or whatnot, or even people that respect the King James Bible because of its antiquity and all that other stuff. All right? And a lost guy will sit down and read it and he'll say, wow, this is beautiful prose. This is a majestic uh, liter literary form. Well, that's great. But he is not receiving illumination from the Holy Spirit of God. He has the Word of God, but you know what? He doesn't have the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. I am willing to say that a Christian, born again, can sit down with his Bible and he can read it and it be just as dead to him as a lost man reading it if he is not in touch with the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit's illumination from that book. You know what? The, the, the saved guy can get worse. He can find a whole bunch of heresy in there. The Mormons have verses, folks. The Jehovah's Witnesses have verses. The Church of Christ people have verses. And if you're not careful, they will trip you up. It's not about having verses. It's about having the Holy Spirit of God. Never think that just because you have the Word of God under your arm that you are somehow impervious to attack or that you are unstoppable by the devil. Man, he is going to eat you for lunch. You have to have the Word of God. Amen, I've got it. But you have to have the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. You have to make sure that you are walking in the Spirit. There's a lot of people that walk in the flesh, and they wield this thing, and they use it, and they hurt people. They cut somebody's head off spiritually, cut their own head off, because they are not in touch with the Holy Spirit of God. Got to make sure that the Word and the power of God are together. Jesus Christ said, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Whoa. Well, there it is again. 
They were ignoring, they were ignoring the written word of God because they were ignoring the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And we often do the same thing. But there in verse 7, it shows very clearly, 7 and 8, as we saw, that the armor of righteousness, and of course this is referring to the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 5, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and having done all to stand, the whole, preach out for, for, for months. But the warfare is spiritual, folks. Never forget that. The Bible says also in Corinthians, it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual, but powerful by, uh, from, from God, the pulling down of strongholds. It's not a carnal weapon. It's not a carnal warfare. That guy out there is not your enemy. The lost guy is not your enemy. The Catholic church over here is not your enemy. Okay, I say that my grandparents are Catholic. My grandfather died earlier this year, being a Catholic his whole life. I have family members that are Catholic. I am a missionary to a, large, to a majority Catholic country. The Catholic church over here is not your enemy. There is something behind, there's something greater than them, behind them. That's our enemy. It's a spiritual warfare. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's not talking about Washington, D.C. as much as I would like to say it is. Okay? Okay, I believe that there's an there's a application there. But ultimately, it's talking about the spirit realm, the true enemy of the Christian. So, just be careful. Just remember, your brother in Christ, that is somebody for whom Christ died. That's not your enemy. And you know what? I'll go so far as to say, if you are mistreating somebody in the body, you are not discerning the Lord's body. There's something about that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's really interesting how almost all of this is coming out of Corinthians. I like it. God takes that whole body thing seriously. Be careful. Remember that this warfare is a spiritual warfare. So we're workers together with Him. And all of this goes together to show that this is God's work. Verse 10, it says, As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. The true riches... And even uh, Christ mentions that over in Luke chapter 16, the first half of the chapter. True riches being committed unto somebody's trust, which is spiritual things as opposed to carnal things. He says, as sorrowful. Why? Because outside, if you would have seen Paul, he did not, I'm sorry, he did not wear a tie. He did not have a nice suit. He probably didn't even have decent shoes to wear to church on Sunday. Okay, this is all stuff that we've kind of brought along with us over the years. He would have looked more like a beggar you see outside of the McDonald's asking for change. Okay, Paul wouldn't ask for change, but he would have looked more like that guy. All tore up, all, all messed up, probably not, doesn't smell so great. Okay, if you just look at the life that Paul led, that's probably what more along the lines, more accurate of a depiction than a lot of the famous independent Baptist uh, evangelists that run around the country flying here, hither, thither, and yon. I'll just be, just be real blunt. He would have looked as like a really sorry person, but he said, always rejoicing. Why? Because he knew that this is, this is, this is nothing. This is going to die. It's going to go in a hole. It's going to be worm food, and I'm going to be with Jesus. When you get that perspective, man, nothing down here really matters anymore. The, the mortgage and the car payment, the 401k and the investments and the this, that and the other thing. It's like, it's all going to burn up. As poor and yet making many rich. Why? Because he, he says, he just got done saying in, in first, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. 
What treasure? Jesus Christ. And that vessel must be broken so He can shine out. So He was joyful that He was able to be broken so that Jesus Christ could be made manifest in His life. Making many rich, He was able to preach the wealth, the incredible prosperity spiritually of the Gospel that you can be in Christ, be in His body, be bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. You can be a child of God. You can be born again and have a, an eternal communion with God. Making many rich. And he says, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. Why? Because in this life, he said, I have nothing. But you know what? It's nothing. I have everything in Christ. If we are ever to be workers together with him in his work, if we are ever to be ministers together of God, and if we are ever to properly employ the word and the power of God in this life, we're going to have to get to Paul's position there in chapter 10. Understanding that if it's visible, for, uh, for 2 Corinthians 4.18, if it's visible, it doesn't exist. Because those things which truly do exist are invisible and they are eternal. We have to get our eyes, why he says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. It's Colossians chapter 3. If you want to get, if you want to get in God's perspective, if you ever want to take God's side against your own, we're going to have to come to this position, this point where we realize that it's His work, it's His glory, and we just get to be partakers in it if we're faithful to what He's called us to do. Thank you, preacher.